Welcome to the Osmosis Daily Report on the Coronavirus Pandemic. I'm Dr. Risha Desai. I'm the Chief Medical Officer at Osmosis. I'm also a Pediatric Infectious Disease Physician, and I used to work in the CDC in the Division of Viral Diseases, doing virus outbreak research. Today we're going to talk about vitamin D for respiratory infections. Now there aren't any great studies looking at COVID-19 and vitamin D, but vitamin D has been studied for other acute respiratory infections. In fact, there's a lot of data on that, and so I thought we'd go over that data and how it might apply to COVID-19. Let's start with this paper which goes over modulation of the immune response. Basically, vitamin D causes up and down regulation of various cytokines that get released by the body. And there's this wonderful little chart that they have here, which shows you what happens with rhinovirus, RSV, and influenza virus. And what I want you to notice is that in all three of these viral infections, which are acute respiratory infections, like uh, SARS-CoV-2, which causes COVID-19, you're seeing increases or decreases in certain cytokines. In particular, notice that uh, in the influenza virus one, you can see a decrease in IL-6, IL-6 has been talked about a lot with COVID-19, especially in very severe cases, uh, and that those numbers or the levels of IL-6 can go quite high. So the thought is that maybe something that would downregulate IL-6 in particular, or in general, which would immunomodulate your, your immune system, might help to tamp down the response or increase the response to the virus. So this is a theory of how vitamin D would affect your body. Does it actually work? And to see if it worked, I want to look at this study, which looked at a, was a meta-analysis of vitamin D, looking at many, many studies, 25 studies, and 11,000 plus people combined. So lots of individual studies put together to see if we can see an effect of vitamin D on respiratory infections. Here you can see all the studies laid out. These are the studies on the left that they included in this meta-analysis. And what you want to look at is this number one down here for the odds ratio. This is the adjusted odd, odds ratio. Anything to the left of that is basically protective. Anything to the right of that is basically going to be harmful. And so what you, what you notice is that if you look at the overall diamond at the bottom, that is below one and it doesn't really cross one, which tells you that this finding across all these studies is significant. Looking at the data, what I want to draw your attention to is the baseline nanomoles per liter. This is what level of vitamin D did people have, and then did those people benefit from getting vitamin D? So if you look at this group in the, in the less than 25 nanomoles per liter, which is considered quite low, and those folks benefited the most. In fact, their odds ratio was 0.58, which is, which is fantastic, which means that vitamin D was very protective for those folks. Even in the higher group, though, above 25 or equal to 25, it looked protective. I say looked protective because you can see the odds ratio in this case does cross 1, even though the absolute number is 0.89, is lower than 1. So that one is not a significant finding. But among the people that are lower than 25, it was very protective. And, and then the other thing you want to notice is the daily dose equivalent. What they found here is that the folks getting a lower dose of uh, vitamin D seem to be doing the best. In fact, the, the bolus dose, the high amounts of vitamin D, that actually had almost no effect. So really what, what they're finding here is that it's the lower dose that makes a benefit. And just to figure out what this is, you should multiply by, by 40. So this would be less than 800 international units uh, per day or less than 5,600 international units per week, just if you were to, to do it daily for the entire seven days. So this is the NIH website, and they have a whole page dedicated to vitamin D. It's actually incredibly well laid out, so I definitely encourage you to take a read uh, if you're interested in this topic. Uh, one of the things that I wanted to draw your attention to is that vitamin D has been associated not just with acute respiratory infections, but other types of comorbid illness. So for example, if you go down here, you can see that it talks about certain groups of people that are affected, but also you can see it talks about uh, health outcomes. So for example, osteoporosis, cancer, and then down here, this is actually what grabbed my attention. Uh, it's actually been uh, noted to play a role in prevention and treatment of things like diabetes, hypertension, and they say other medical conditions. One of the ones that they cite is congestive heart failure. So these are things that we know relate back to COVID-19 and worsen outcomes for COVID-19. There are a lot of groups that actually have recommended levels of, of vitamin D and, and how much you should take. I think uh, where I take my guidance from, because I, I trust the numbers the most, 
is the endocrine society. Remember, vitamin D is essentially a hormone, and the endocrine society makes guidelines on hormones. And, and in fact, their guidelines, to me, make a lot of sense. So they say that essentially we should be targeting, and this is the key thing here, over 75 nanomoles per liter. That should be our target range, and that equates more than 30 nanograms per milliliter. So that's where our levels should be at. And they say to get at those levels, it might be necessary for adults to take upwards of 2,000 IUs per day and children to get at least, or in adolescents to get at least 1,000 IUs per day. So this is their recommendation for how to achieve those really high levels. Now it begs the question, why do we need supplements in the first place? I mean, if we have these bodies that are perfectly designed in all these other ways, why do we need a supplement to get to a normal level of vitamin D? And I think the answer lies with our lifestyle. In fact, if you look even just a couple generations ago, people were generally getting much more sunlight and were out and about much more than they are today. Today, in most of the world, people are indoors, they're wearing clothes, and they're essentially living a sedentary lifestyle. And that wasn't always the case. So one study uh, tried to get at this by looking at levels of vitamin D in East African populations where they're living a much more pastoral or hunter-gatherer type lifestyle. And they say in the abstract they, that these folks, uh, the Maasai and the Hadzabe, that they tested had skin type 6, had a moderate degree of clothing, spent a major part of their day outdoors, but avoided in general direct exposure to sunlight when possible. And then when you get down to the discussion, there's a really interesting paragraph where they basically talk about the, uh, the findings. They, they didn't see anyone below 50. They, they saw a couple of really high values, 167 and 171, which is just remarkable. And they talk about the fact that they compared this data to two other groups, actually other studies that have been done. One among lifeguards that were uh, working in St. Louis in, in May and June, and another group of Hawaiians that were getting sunlight, you know, at least three hours of sun a day for, for more than five days a week uh, for three months. And so both of these groups, the lifeguards and the Hawaiians, are getting lots of sunshine, and their levels are also above 100. So you're seeing these three very different types of populations all getting tons of sun, all above 100, and it makes you think, okay, so maybe the reason we're not getting the same levels of vitamin D is simply our sun exposure is not what it used to be. So bottom line, it looks like vitamin D is helpful against respiratory viruses and infections. It certainly seems like it's a big and important player against other comorbid illness, and the ideal level seems based on the endocrine society to be around 75 nanomoles per liter and to get there we likely need supplementation mm -hmm. thanks for tuning in hit the red subscribe button and the bell icon to get daily updates uh, you can check out all of our stuff on osmosis.org slash covid19 uh, remember to do your part to flatten the curve and raise the line we're all in this together thanks